Hello and welcome to the Dread Expanse. I'm Mitch the Quack and I hope you're having less quack day than myself. Today we're going to be talking about the Drust, their curse of being outside the cycle of life and death, Thros, and how all three may be related to Ysera, and the return of a major enemy in the future of World of Warcraft. This theory starts with one question. When in the world did this described conflict occur? In Drustvar there are steely scattered around the area that give information about the Drust. One describes a series of conflicts the Drust took part in. All the conflicts and who the Drust fought make sense, except for the first one which reads as follows. In the Elder they fight beings that look like themselves or great beasts. All of the conflicts other than the first can be dated back to as far as 400 years before BFA, when King Mechagon established control over the Vault of Mimron and created the Gnomish controlled Mechagon. This however leaves a staggering amount of time for when this first conflict could have occurred. That time frame is drastically narrowed however, when we consider what is meant by Great Beasts, and a quest I'm pretty certain no one expected to see in Drustvar. During the questing in Drustvar, Alliance players run into a red dragon called Zalestraza, attempting to protect the bones of a green dragon called Vedicus from being raised into undeath. During this quest she mentions that Vedicus died during a battle. Now here's the thing, dragons, in particularly green dragons, to our knowledge, have only participated in a very select few battles. This list is reduced even further when you consider that within the time frame we are looking, there have been no known major battles in that part of the world that would have connections to green dragons. This leaves Priest under Azeroth, and two specific conflicts which undoubtedly saw green dragons fight, the War of the Ancients and the Winterscorn War. Now, where the War of the Ancients is a very real contender for why a green dragon may have been killed in the area of pre sundered Kul'Tras, the other description of the conflict on the Stele perfectly explains which battle is actually being referenced. They fight beings that look like themselves, or great beasts. The Winterscorn War was a civil war between the Titanforged. It was mainly Loken's Rykel fighting against Tyr's Rykel. However, the dragon aspects eventually joined the war and fought with Tyr and his rival. They fight beings that look like themselves or great beasts. The Winterscorn War matches too well, especially when you consider there seems to be some form of druidic sigil or dragons above Vedicus's corpse. What I mean by that is, it's never explained how the Drust learned druidism, but it's fairly safe to say they didn't learn it from scenarios like the elves and the tauren or independently from Atha'ia and Atha'in, the seeming rulers of Kul forests. The stele that seemingly describes Atha'ia, Atha'id and Ulfar likely happened after the Drust, and in turn Ulfar had learnt Druidism, and is depicting the literal and metaphorical acceptance of balance on the part of Ulfar, and those that would go on to become the Kul Tiran Thorn Speakers. The Druidic symbol above Vedicus's body is possible evidence the Winterscorn, not the Drust, learnt druidism from observing and fighting the dragons during the Winterscorn War, a form that was likely never matched in the future. Now before you go and mention in the comments the already confirmed information about the Drust and where they came from, as well as the information about who is confirmed to be the first druid on Azeroth, I need to say, I know all that information, and I will address it. Firstly however, I need to address the where. How do I figure the Winterscorn War spread as far as Kul Taras? Simply put, there is no breadth or width given to the Winterscorn War other than Northern Azeroth. We know some of the major battles occurred in the Storm Peaks and Uldum, but other than that, there could have been Rykel all across the north of Azeroth that took up the call to fight in the name of joining Odin in the Halls of Valor, which yes, is considered the reason why the Winterscorn were so willing to be bloodthirsty and vicious. And if this isn't convincing enough, Tearguard Sound should be the dead giveaway pre-sundering Kul'Tras was once a part of the Winterscorn War. I mean seriously, Tyr's Fall translates to Tyr's Fall. If Tyrgard's sound isn't a reference to Tyr, I'll be genuinely shocked. What's a possible translation of Tyrgard's sound? It's likely, accounting for nuance, Tyr's sound guard, or considering guard in French means keep, Tyr's keep sound, as in sound was the name of the keep, and is possibly referencing the Norwich Estate Bell if it's actually that old. Overall, considering the context of this theory, the implication is Kul Taras was the location Tyr orchestrated his resistance against Loken from, during the Winterscorn War, 
and was quite possibly, considering a battle with dragons occurred in the region, the location the aspects defeated the Winterscorn. It actually explains why there are trogs, ex earthen in the area. They are likely the remnants of the Titan Forged Tyr was protecting. This also reveals the possibility the landmass that became Colteras was significantly further north before the Sundering. And even if it wasn't, and you really want to push this theory, prior to the Sundering, Colteras may have been the landmass that is currently missing between Gilneas and Arathi, and garnered its name from the assumed sound of Tyr's explosive sacrifice at Tyr's fall. As in it was the place Arcadus, Ionia, and the other Titanforged realized they were safe. I mean, when you look at the chronicle post sundering map of Azeroth, not only does Kul'Taras perfectly fit into the space between Gilneas and Arathi, the Shrine of the Storms and the Drowned Reef, ex Titan facility backed on Stromgard, perfectly match in their positioning. It's almost too easy to say they were once upon a time the same location until the sundering. This isn't mentioning that Mechagon kind of supports both possibilities in its sheer existence and lore. Mechagon was seemingly abandoned until King Mechagon showed up. It was likely abandoned by the Mechagnomes escaping the massacres Lokans of Rykel were committing against the other Titanforged. If this is the case, it's quite likely Mechagon was a part of the Winterscorn War, and kind of explains why there are Rykel artifacts in the area. It's also worth mentioning that if the location of Mechagon was a part of the Winterscorn War, it would have been a strategic linchpin worth protecting on Tyr's part, considering Mimron's weapons, in the wrong hands, can basically wipe out entire planets. But anyway, regardless of this pseudo-theory, the Northern Eastern Kingdoms were significantly further north before the Sundering, and it's likely Kul Taras moved south at the same time, meaning there is a semi-reasonable chance parts of the Winterscorn War, if not the decisive battle of the Winterscorn War, took place on the location that would eventually become Kul Taras. Now, the reason the Winterscorn War is important is because of how the Winterscorn lost the war. As in, they lost the war because of the Dragon Aspects. But how the Dragon Aspects won is intriguing. Specifically what Ysera Nosdormu did, which reads as follows. Ysera Nosdormu combined their powers to create a spell that would bring a decisive end to the battle. Ysera Nosdormu enveloped the Winterscorn in a cloying mist that caused the Titanforge to fall asleep. These incapacitated creatures were then locked away in tomb seas across northern Kalimdor. Kalimdor pre sundering being the name of the entire continent. They would not know the peaceful sleep of the Emerald Dream. Rather, they would languish in a timeless, unconscious slumber for thousands upon thousands of years. Enter the Gols. Golvar, Golinath, Golisagir, and Golkavol. In particular, Golkavol. When questing through Kolteras, one place that is seemingly forgotten by the quests is Gorkovol. There is minimal questing in the area, and after the initial quests, other than a few world quests, players never really revisit the area. Now what's very interesting about Gorkovol is that firstly it was practically built into a glacier, a big one, and so at one point it was likely underground. This observation can also technically be applied to all of the goals. Secondly, Gorkovol is interesting because it arguably has the most steelies in its vicinity outside of the Crimson Forest. The specific steelies being the flayed man, the ritual, and breath into stone. Why are these observations important? Well, we've technically been to one of the tomb cities the aspects locked the winter's corner away in. Jotunheim in ICC is seemingly one of these locations. It also just happened to be practically buried under a glacier until Illidan nearly destroyed all of Ice Crown. There is also Galabron, which is not one of the aspects tombed cities but is another of Rykel's stasis complex. The dragon flayers, in an attempt to stave off the curse of flesh, put themselves into stasis within its halls. What's interesting about Galabron, though, is unofficially it's likely it was a part of the melted glacier between the Howling Fjord and the Grizzly Hills. And also as a fun fact, there is also apparently a shrine to the moon on the other mountain of this glacier, which for those who completed the quest related to the shrine, cleanse them of their inner turmoils so they could then find and speak to a warg that was having problems with one of Aragorn's worgen from the Grizzly Hills. But anyway, I think I got the initial point across. Rykel's stasis chambers have a habit of being attached to glaciers. Gorkavol's location isn't an accident. It's one of the few places in Drasfar that actually has proper skeletal undead Rykel walking around instead of the druidic monstrosities seen practically everywhere else in the zone, which once again isn't an accident. 
Bulk of all, and quite possibly all the goals, may have been some of the cities the Aspect locked the Winter Scorn within. And before you think I'm going to say these Vrykul woke up and became the Drust we fight, I tell you right now, nothing even close to something that pleasant happened to the Winter Scorn. No, the Drust's origin is a lot longer, and is incredibly well breadcrumbed throughout the lore actually. And moving on to that origin, post Sundering we know the Vrykul were seafaring and it's confirmed one of the Rykel tribes eventually found Kul Taras. Now what isn't mentioned in this information but heavily implied by the Chronicle stories, the Winter Scorn Moor and the Children of Giants, the Rise of Humanity, is that fundamentally the Rykel had been split into two overarching factions long before this point. One faction were the Rykel who followed Tears south, and eventually those who fled south with their quote unquote malformed infants who would eventually go on to become humans. The other overarching faction of Rykul, who stayed in the north but weren't imprisoned with the Winter Scorn and may have fought against them, were the Scorn. This overarching faction of Rykul almost certainly had tribes like Dragonflayers and the Tide Scorn as a part of their number, and I'm willing to bet the initial uniting similarity all the Scorn tribes had was a belief in Odin and the promise of the Halls of Valor. The reason why I'm calling this overarching faction the Scorn, by the way, is because of the literal town called Scorn in the Howling Fjord, which just happens to have banners identical to those found in Galabron, and the Tide Scorn holdings in Stormheim. The Tide Scorn technically being three separate Rykel tribes under the banner of the God King. King Yimron, the guy who came out of stasis just to see us kill his wife, and who we then proceeded to kill twice, once in Ukgar Keep and the other in the Moor of Souls, at Magna Icebreaker, the guy who stole a scale from Neltheria and lived, the creator of the prop warrior artifact weapon, and the guy who liberated Stormheim from the elves for the Rykel were likely alive around the same time and had different views on the Keepers. Hence why there was eventually a split in the Scorn Rykel which led to the Dragonflayers in Hallet Fjord and the Scorn that would eventually be known as the Tide Scorn in Stormheim. Now skipping back to post Sundering Azeroth and to Stormheim, who remembers the Rudewood and Dryagrot? The Runewood being the home of Vidar, the Vrykel that with the help of the High Mountain Tauren turned himself into a tree, and Dryagrot being the tomb of Bloodthane Lucard, the Vrykel Vampire. Now other than one of these locations being a Castlevania reference back in Legion, both actually hold a lot of significance. Remember how I mentioned we weren't told how the Drust learnt Druidism? Well working backwards, taking into consideration that we know the Drust originated from seafaring Vrykel, it's reasonable to assume that this information ties them to the Tide Scorn of Stormheim and the Runewood. The initial assumption being they learned Druidism from the High Mountain Tauren. Going further back though, specifically to the town of Scorn, a similarity between the Dragonflays and the Tide Scorn becomes apparent. Both collectors of Rykel are shockingly close to world trees and the Druidic creatures of the area. And where Vordrasil came ages after the Scorn of Rykel assumedly split, it, the land itself is the interesting part. Common factor being, creatures tied to the Emerald Dream slash Shadowlands inhabited the areas. The Grizzly Hills specifically was the home of Ursol and Ursoc, not to mention it's adjacent to the Gundrak, which prior to the Trolls occupation of the area, likely contained Tolvia and served a similar purpose to Zoltazar as a whole. That purpose, by the way, considering Aldea, Ataltazar and the surrounding regions, was to be a place the Titanforge could experiment on Corrupted Lower and attempt to purge them of the Elf God's corruption. So with this in mind, remember how I mentioned the Winter Scorn learnt Druidism from watching the dragons? That was the first option. The second option, and the option that likely applies to all of Rykel, is that when the Curse of Flesh started to afflict them, one of the earlier methods they used in an attempt to stop the Curse of Flesh was some form of blood magic they learnt from observing the experiments in Gun Track and applied the methods to themselves. These experiments with blood magic obviously didn't work, but I think a side effect of these attempts to purify themselves led to the Rykel creating and or discovering to some form of primitive pseudo druidism, quote unquote blood druidism and quote unquote blood druids. Basically at the very least, I think they established the foundations that would eventually see the Gilneans know of and use pseudo druidic practices before they were turned into Worgen, as well as possibly being the foundations of the Bone Speaker tribe slash cult in Stormheim. There is a third option here which assumes there were Titanforged specifically designed to know about Druidism or at least the death aspect of Druidism, and then in a similar fashion to the second possibility, created and or discovered quote unquote blood Druids, 
which would actually explain how the Titan Forge managed to not interfere with the Shadowlands, or on the other hand how they specifically interfered with the Shadowlands. But anyway, the only proof I have of this possibility is Helia having knowledge of the Shadowlands and the assumption that she can't have been the only Titan Forge sorceress with that knowledge, and the possibility that Keeper Tia had a lot more to do with the Shadowlands than we currently know. Whichever of these options proves to be true or false, I still think the Scorned Reichel learnt some base form of druidic magic in the Grizzly Hills. The Winter Scorn tribe, likely due to Loken's influence, took this magic to its furthest extreme and learnt how to change into dragons. The other Scorn tribes likely never took the magic that far and only attempted to cleanse themselves of the curse of flesh, but retained aspects of this magic in their culture. Now, when the Scorn tribes split into the Dragon Flares and Tide Scorn, I think the quote unquote blood druids went south to Stormheim and established Husfold and the Runewood with the Bone Speakers. This would first explain Vahidar and how one day he would be able to use the High Mountain's druidic techniques to turn himself into a tree, as in he already knew of and had practiced pseudo druidic magic. Secondly, this adds to the idea there may have been Titan Forge with some form of knowledge of death magic other than Helia, due to Husfold's initial independence and eventual connection to Helheim. Now eventually, like always, after Hosswald was established and everything seemed to be settled, I think something happened. I'm not sure what, but if it turned out the quote unquote blood druids were way too bloodthirsty and were corrupting the Runewood, I wouldn't be surprised. I also wouldn't be surprised if the leader of the quote unquote blood druids turned himself into a vampire and started spreading his curse, and that was the cause for this tribe's exile, but either way, they were exiled. Now the reason why I'm certain these quote unquote blood druids and their tribe were exiled is because even when the bone speakers fell to the corruption of Helia and or the Legion and or just both, they didn't disturb Bloodthane Mukart's tomb. They actually left it alone. And when we consider everything we currently know about Legion, Helia and death, the fact he was left alone implies a lot. Whatever this thing was related to, not even the factions I just mentioned wanted to touch it. And in turn, it's likely Lucard was at one of the Vrykels on it dead. If anything, considering he was still alive when we found him, that tomb was likely his prison. So, if this specific Vrykel tribe was exiled, what happened to them? As you've probably already guessed, I think they became the Drust. However, before we get to them, I'd like to mention that I think before they ended up on the shores of Kul Taras, these exiled Vrykel became the Bloodwake. Who are the Bloodwake? In BFA, one of the later quests you can pick up from Island Expeditions takes you to the Runewood and Vidar. Once you hand in the quest, Vidar talks about a legendary fleet of the greatest Rykel raiders led by Yorn, the island Yorindol is named after. This fleet is called the Blood Wake, who might I add, do not have anything to do with the Gavaldia or Helia. Now Vidar says, Yorn left with some say thousands of ships, for basically the sole purpose of raiding. But as is implied by the quest text, Vidar wasn't there when this happened, so it's likely this event happened long before he was alive and eventually turned himself into a tree. With this in mind and the sporadic information we have, I think there is just enough information to connect the Bloodthane, Yorn's departure, and their relation to the Blood Druids. The overall story being something along the lines of, a shockingly large tribe or tribes within Tyne Scorn were highly aggressive and legendary raiders. These raiders were likely exiled or driven away because of their bloodthirsty nature and the rituals their mystics used. The straw that broke the camel's back and likely got these tribes exiled were the alterations done to Bloodthane Lucard, which turned him into a vampire. And so taking a few thousand ships, these tribes left Stormheim under their new leader Yorn to never return. And from there I think one or more of these tribes ended up on the shores of Drusvar and decided to settle, eventually calling themselves the Drust. Now why did some of these raiding minded Rykel decide to settle down and how does all of this relate to the Winter Scorn in Gol Kaval? Well, this is where stuff starts to get interesting. The Vrykel who became the Drust may have been looking for the island. Why? Well, if Kol Taras is the location where the Winter Scorn were defeated and or a large portion of them were imprisoned within the region or Kul Taras was the place Tyr staged his resistance from, I'd be shocked if there wasn't at least one Rykel legend about the location that lasted through the ages, similar to the Gnomish legends of Mechagon. But I guess that's the how, not the why. 
I think the vehicle that founded Kulturas ended up being shockingly similar to the Dragon Flayers in ideology. They didn't believe in the Keepers anymore, or Odin's promise, but were still scorned Rykel and thought Flesh was weak and wanted their own immortal Titanforged bodies. And I think similar to the Mogu, the Drust went out of their way to create their own. The first step was finding the fabled Kulturas and the two cities of the Winterscorn. You could argue they didn't know about the Curse of Flesh affecting those in stasis, and so they were hoping to find a cure. But regardless, they found the Winterscorn's stasis pods. First step complete. And it's at this point, I have to say, despite the fact they were mass murderers, I have to feel slightly sorry for what I think happened to the Winterscorn when the Drust found them in stasis and moved to step two. What am I talking about? Well, you know how I mentioned those steelies in Golkovol? You know, breath into the stone, the ritual, and the flayed man? Yeah. So it's quite likely the Drust found the Winterspawn in hibernation, and if I'm interpreting these steelies correctly, the Drust attempted to create their own Titanforged bodies by taking the Winter Scorn out of stasis and skinning them alive for their organs. I don't think the Winter Scorn were conscious while this was going on, but honestly, I wouldn't put it past the Drust. Anyway, once these bodies were flayed, it seems the Drust used them in two ways. Initially, the Drust somehow managed to turn the hearts of the Winter Scorn into runic power cords, which they then used to anchor souls to their constructs around Golkovol, aligning with the breath into the stone steely. I also just want to make this clear, the Drust likely transferred their souls willingly into these constructs, and probably saw it as an honour. And or, as Drust archaeology points out, they just used their own dead. These Vrykul were very similar to the Mogu, except arguably worse. As the Drust got better at binding souls, the second thing I think the Drust likely used the Winter Scorn's bodies for was fuel and parts, so they could create their massive lifeless constructs. As in the Ritual Steely just happens to be located right next to the Rhinestone Construct world boss in Drustvar. This is the Steely that describes a lot of animal sacrifices, and quite likely Rykel sacrifices as well. If you've ever picked up the Permafrost Encrusted Heart Trinket from that boss, Oh yes, that trinket's origin is quite possibly that messed up. And here's the kicker of a fun fact to all of this. Bavol in Ukrainian means blacksmith. I swear whoever designed that zone had fun adding that twisted little tidbit. If this theory is correct, we know why that location was called Kovol. Gol Kovol, in its own twisted sense, was basically an extremely disturbed, primeval forge. Now with everything we know so far, you'd have expected the souls of the Winter Scorn to go to the Shadowlands, and all the Drust to have just used their souls as some form of fuel to empower their creations. Thing is, we know they didn't go to the Shadowlands, and where it's possible the Drust may have attempted to use the Winter Scorn souls, I think it's quite likely they couldn't, because every time they tried, the souls would just disappear and go directly to Thross, or more aptly, the Winter Scorn's souls would remain in Thross. Remember how I mentioned it's not the fact that Winterscorn lost the Winterscorn War, it's how they lost the war that's important? As in the Winterscorn were quite specifically put to sleep by a cloying mist created by Ysera and Nosdormu, designed to keep them in an unconscious stasis separate from the Emerald Dream forever. Do you also remember Fate's End, the place Jaina ends up when she's exiled at the start of BFA, the place that's covered in a mist that not only leads to Thross, but also in the past, quite literally vanished an entire settlement of Kul'tirans, likely transporting every last soul to Thross, to face a very similar fate to Jaina, who might I add, was basically trapped in a dark timeless loop, reliving all the memories in her life she regretted. If it hasn't clicked yet, here's the statement. When the Winterscorn's bodies were mutilated by the Drust and eventually destroyed, I think the Winter Scorn's souls woke up, which would have been a nightmare in of itself. The bigger problem for them though, was that because of the stasis spell cast upon them, their souls couldn't leave the prison created for them, meaning they were now trapped in a timeless and practically lifeless prison. This is why I think in Shadowlands the Drust are described as being cursed to live outside the cycle of life and death. It's because it's highly, highly likely that curse is the spell cast upon them by Ysera and Stormwind, and its effect is still active. 
And it's also quite possible that the mist surrounding Fate's End is either the remnants of that original mist that put the Winter Scorn to sleep, or these spirits trapped in Thross recreating it. Now, I know their first response to this is, okay, assuming this quack idea is true, how do you explain them apparently being barred from the Emerald Dream, but still being the Nightmare? And not only the Nightmare, by the way, but another Nightmare outside of the Nightmare we've been dealing with for years. The answer I have to this is actually surprisingly simple. Remember what happened to the Satyr after the War of the Ancients? A lot were put to sleep in a secluded part of the Emerald Dream connected to the World Tree Shaladrasil, the intent being for the Satyr to be internally prisoned within the Dream as punishment instead of being mercilessly culled. Remember what happened to the first Worgen? Once again, they were imprisoned and put to sleep within a secluded part of the Dream, this time under the Great Tree Dalralnir in the Emerald Dream, or its physical universe counterpart, Tal'Doran. I don't think it's a coincidence Vedicus was a green dragon, I think it was a hint. The hint possibly being that the Winter Scorn's spirits, similar to the Satyr and Worgen, were locked quite specifically to a great tree and or world tree within the Emerald Dream. If anything, considering the timeline, they may have been the original proof of concept. The bad joke is, considering everything that's gone on in World of Warcraft, we know the concept is flawed. We know the Drust and those connected to Thross are attached to the Nightmare, and we've seen inside parts of that dream. We know what happened to this prison. It did Amar Doom and became Thross the Blighted Lands, a place of nightmares, seemingly separate from the quote unquote Xavian slash quote unquote Ruby nightmare created by Nazoth. Ysera and Nosdormu basically managed to inadvertently create the perfect circumstances for Thross and a different form of the nightmare to not only emerge, but thrive and in turn create the Drust we now face. The only thing I really need to explain now is how the Drust and the Winter Scorn's trapped spirits became connected to each other and how Thross managed to become so corrupt. And oh boy, thought things were interesting now, just wait. In Shadowlands it turns out the Drust have these masks that can turn the denizens of Ardenweald into complete savages. The masks make them forget their oaths, attack those they consider friends, and basically turn them into agents of the Drust. Here's the thing though, that's not a new concept. That's actually a concept that to my knowledge has only appeared once outside of the Lich King. And the Lich King has its own explanation. And so I've been very curious about this obscure piece of lore ever since I first saw it. Time to go back to everyone's favourite expansion, WAD. There are a few rather obnoxious to acquire daily quests in Ward that Harrison Jones will offer. They're called treasure contracts. One of these quests takes you to Gorgron to deal with the Skulltaker. Skulltaker is a Laughing Skull Orc that apparently started to kill other members of the Laughing Skull after he placed the Silent Skull on his head. The skull is apparently cursed, but even with that brief description I just gave, you could probably already tell that. And I've also probably put two and two together as the effects of this skull are practically identical to what's going on with the Night Fae in Ardenwield. The only difference is masks are being used in Ardenwield instead of a skull. I should also point out that in this quest line you actually go to a place that I originally thought was the Shadowlands. It still could be, but I'm still uncertain. But what's really important about this rather odd realm is that you discover Ravengers seem to have minor sentience and they are helping Skulltaker escape the orcs hunting him seemingly because they also have an obsession with skulls. But anyway, do I think the similarities between the Silent Skull Curse that appeared in the incredibly nature-heavy Everbloom end of Gorgrond, and what's happening with the Drust's masks and the Night Fae is a coincidence? No, I'm a quack after all. But seriously, this is where something about Gorak Tull and his look before his near-death experience at the hands of Arnhem Wakerest becomes incredibly important. Gorak Tull looked like a normal Rykel before he disappeared, and came back looking the way he does in Waycrest Manor. Now, I might be pulling at strings here, but if I was to say that Gorak Tull is what happens when one of the Drust's masks from Shadowlands is on a creature for too long, would you really be that surprised? Personally, I wouldn't be, and I think it's precisely what happened. I think initially, something reached out to the Winterscorn stuck in Thross through those masks. And in a similar way to the desperate Night Fae and Ardenwield, the Winter Scorned turned to the masks for power and lost themselves. 
or considering the consciousness of the Vykal with these masks on, they wholeheartedly gave themselves to the power. Either way, while the Winter Scorn were being corrupted in Thross, or after they were, over time I think the power behind these masks started to envelop the Drust culture because of their faint connection to nature magic and the excessive amount of blood rituals they were performing, a process that was likely made easier due to the corrupted Winter Scorn's old knowledge about the Vrykel's underlining pseudo-druidic slash quote-unquote blood druidic practices. It explains how over time the Drust managed to create revenants it, with those masks on, it never wore them, and gained proficiency in a very primal form of druidism whilst also managing to keep their incredibly bloody rituals, which at one point seemingly sees them sacrifice the heart of the Crimson Forest, which, if I was to guess, is how they created the tree over Golanar, which probably acted as a way to create a greater connection to Thross and the physical universe for this power behind the masks. From here, I think the corruption was slow, but likely effective considering the conflicts with the Mechanomes and Naga were seemingly in the favour of the Drust. Then, after getting what it came for, I think this power let the Drust lose to the Kul Tirans, with the express intent of bringing the Drust under its control fully, Baraktul being the final result and the Kul Tirans being a new target. To also be clear, I do understand the Kul Tirans were impressively resourceful in their ways of combating the Drust, and they had the Thorn Speakers on their side, but unless the Drust suddenly became incompetent overnight, I highly doubt they could repel the Naga, then lose to humans. So at this point, the question is, what power allowed itself to be used by the Drust, while simultaneously corrupting them to the point of dependency, and somehow convince them to not only create a great tree, but also commit to maintaining blood sacrifices to the tree, which seemingly allowed it to use those souls to create more corrupted Rykel, similar to the Winter Scorn and Gorak Tool. This isn't mentioning being clever enough to use the Drust's dependence on this magic to ensure their downfall, while also planning centuries in advance to use Gorak Tool to take advantage of the new settlers in the region to further spread its power. Now we're saying it was Thross all along, and these events were all orchestrated by the Winter Scorn inside the Nightmare to get revenge against the Drust, is possible, I just need a bit more proof for that statement to be proven true. So instead we're going to move on to the second version of this theory in regards to what happened with the Drust and their connection to the spirits inside Thross, which also just happens to tie directly into the possible answer behind what the power behind Thross is. And don't worry, this won't be a 30 minute long tangent. The first and second version of this theory and how the Drust and the Winter Scorn are connected is practically identical. The only difference with the second option is adding the tagline, from the beginning all of these events were the machinations of Yogg-Saron. The theory practically remains the same with a few variations here and there. Oh and yes, for these first and second version of this theory, it's quite possible that Yogg-Saron is behind the Drust's corruption. How in the world did I pull an old god into this? Well, long story short, Vordrasil let Yogg-Saron into the Emerald Dream and then it's explicitly mentioned that he let the other old gods into the Emerald Dream. There's just one thing about that. We have never seen Yogg's corruption anywhere within the Emerald Dream. We've only seen the Zoths. For me personally, this has never made any sense. Why in the world did the strongest of the three remaining old gods, who got into the Emerald Dream first no less, let the others in, then just drop off the face of the planet? somehow allowing apparently the weakest of the old gods enough freedom to basically hijack the realm. I have figured out an answer to that question, but if the answer I have come to is correct, we're in deep trouble. Aldia, Zegvoz, the Herald of Nazoth, the Akia we fight inside the Titan Archive, a fight that strangely enough has an achievement connected to the puzzle box of Yogg-Saron. The three phases and three sets of mechanics from that fight are seemingly based on the three remaining old gods and their titles, which seemingly depict the major traits of each old god. Nuzoth the Corrupter being Corruption, Sithun being Chaos, and yogg saron being Deception. Now where these are interesting conceptual associations to each old god, unlike Yasharaj, who was known as the God of Seven Heads, which can be taken literally or metaphorically considering the Shah, and Nuzoth the Corrupter, which is obviously displayed by the Emerald Nightmare, and the way he literally just overwhelms beings with shadow energy, Sithun and Yogg-Saron's concepts honestly make little to no sense. C 
See, Thun's relation to Chaos still kind of doesn't. However, I've got a sneaking suspicion he has a lot more to do with the Quill Ball than you'd expect. But once again, I still need significantly more information to prove that point. Yorksoran, on the other hand, kind of made sense considering how he corrupted Logan. But other than that, I would have expected something relating to death considering his self-proclaimed title as God of Death and his apparent unspecified relation to the Lich King that was never explored in Ra. That was until I started paying attention to the other names Yorksoran started to call himself as in the lucid dream, the monster in your nightmares, the fiend of thousand faces, especially that last one, and also realized what those masks in the Shadowlands and possibly the curse on alternate Draenor technically do to those that put the masks on and how they are seemingly acquired. What do I think the masks do? Well, other than the obvious corruption, technically, I think the masks turn the users into a faceless. And where I know I must sound more quack than usual, hear me out. Zoth, the Corrupter, has the Merciless, face huggers that I swear will turn you into a Kathea if you leave them on your head long enough, and or an Araki if you're exposed to enough Shadow Energy. Now the Merciless, and to an extent the Zoth, basically seem to be a more controlling, evolved and aggressive version of the Amorphic Cognitors on Ultra Draenor, basically Shadow Corrupted versions. They are all fundamentally weak by themselves and outside of a host, but highly dangerous once attached to a host and incredibly efficient at extracting information from said host. Not mentioning that the bigger these things get, the more psychic power they get. The catch, once again being, once they outgrow their host, they need to find another of a suitable size. There's just a good chance that once they reach a certain size, they can't float anymore and have to remain in large bodies of water to move restricting their possible food sources. At this stage, they may also start to lose their highly adaptive sentience and psychic abilities unless they can find a host and or a source of magic. So yeah, Merciless, the Zotaroids and the Squid-like Kraken are quite possibly the same creatures just on different evolutionary paths. And Azoth might be an uber shadow charged version of the species. Now where the Merciless are proactive, their ability to control a target is very limited unless their target has been, well, quote unquote, corrupted enough for the Merciless to exert control over the body. Not only this though, unless the process of corruption is completed, the Merciless are surprisingly easy to remove. They're basically squid after all, and their corruption has been proven to be relatively easy to cleanse, if cleansed in a timely manner. I say relatively because this is where these masks come in, which I think may be Yogg-Saron's equivalent of the Merciless. Instead of being proactive, these masks are stagnant, and need to be found and accepted before Yogg-Saron can spread his influence. The process of corruption in Yogg-Saron's case is considerably slower and fundamentally wouldn't work if it wasn't for the deception and opportunism Yogg-Saron employs. In Drust Archaeology, there is an artifact called Dance of the Dead, another called Fetish of the Tormented Mind. These items in unison basically tell us the Drust used subtle, unorthodox and deceptive methods to kill their enemies. Drust used fetishes and items that were seemingly mundane and mixed them with potent curses and spells to weaken the minds of their foes before striking. And when you think about Gorak Tool and the Heartsbane's Coven's infiltration of Drusvar, it's quite apparent deception is fundamentally embedded within the Drust magic and culture, which if they learnt from Yogg makes perfect sense. Now the reason why I think Yogg-Saron operates in this manner is because once something is corrupted through this manner of deception, and willingly, begrudging or otherwise, accepting of this power, attempts to cleanse this form of corruption becomes near impossible. So in comparison to Nazoth, the reason why Yogg-Saron is significantly more dangerous is because once he gets a hold of something, unless you annihilate it, he's not letting go. And what's interesting about all of this is I think the reason why Yogg-Saron's corruption is so effective has been thoroughly explained in BFA. Deals. It would be very interesting if Yogg-Saron's corruption was a form of deal that bound a spirit to his will. It would explain why his corruption is so effective. The Drust's battle methodology and why his corruption is slow to spread under normal circumstances, but highly effective in a crisis or near-death situations. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, something that just keeps shocking the Night Fae about the Drust's masks is how they manage to keep spreading so quickly. But when you consider the state of the Shadowlands, Ardenwild specifically, and the mindset most of the Night Fae would be in, without the imminent invasion of the Drust, how the masks are spreading so quickly makes perfect sense. They're desperate, scared, and in some cases on the brink of dying forever. It's the perfect environment for Yogg-Saron's corruption to spread. 
And actually, this would set up an interesting parallel between Yogg-Saron and Nazoth, and Bonsam the Moizala. What I mean by that is, if the few playthroughs I've watched are still up to date, Moizala takes to gain his power, Bonsamdi makes deals for his, and in a similar fashion, Nazoth being the corrupter takes to gain his power, while Yogg-Saron being the trickster makes deals, incredibly opportunistic and one-sided deals, but deals all the same to gain his. Corruption vs Deception The current method of deceptive corruption Yogg is currently using is like the masks we see on the corrupted Drust, which if you really want to stretch your imagination, seem to be designed to create a stylized form of the faceless related to nature more than anything else, which if true, may imply Yogg-Saron has a considerably diverse amount of servants corrupted in a multitude of different ways, as in he may have different types of faceless. Now at this point I imagine this question has come to mind. How do I explain Goraktor specifically stating Thross is the land of the dead and that death stalks us at every turn? Considering the context of this theory, the answer is pretty simple. Goraktor was quite possibly lied to. We know the corrupted Drust didn't go to the Shadowlands and are literally said to be outside the cycle of life and death. Yogg-Saron probably offered Goraktor power through one of the masks as he was dying and when he accepted it probably pulled him into Thross if he wasn't already stuck inside the realm. And honestly, I don't think Gorak Tool would have cared much for the truth anyway. All he seemingly wanted was revenge, and Yogg was seemingly quite willing to oblige if he got a new pawn in the process. What should worry us though is that if it wasn't death that's stalking us, then uh, yeah. There is another old god on the move, currently no one within the lore knows about. Moving on, if this theory is correct and Yogg-Saron's power is stagnant in nature, it explains why we haven't seen Yogg-Saron's presence in the Emerald Dream. His ability to corrupt the dream in comparison to Nazoth would and is highly limited, and if Yogg-Saron did have a presence in the dream, I would be quite willing to guess Nazoth quite specifically went out of its way to suppress that power. The reason I think this is because if the Drust were being influenced by Yogg-Saron, we know the Naga, who were expressly servants of Nazoth, attacked the Drust at some point in time, which was likely Nazoth's first attempt at suppressing Yogg's influence on Azeroth, post Sundering which would actually make sense if Nazoth did have a significant presence in the Shrine of the Storms. Yogg-Saron and the Drust assumedly would have originally been suppressing Nazoth's presence on Azeroth, and that's what eventually prompted the Naga invasions. Either way though, we then have the possibility that Ajara was the Tide Mother, or at the very least managed to mimic her, which led to the Kul Tirans eventually taking over Kul Taras, and thoroughly suppressing the Drust for centuries, until quite recently with their resurgence meaning overall Nazoth seemingly won the battle of influence on Kul Taras. I say seemingly because I will always maintain the most dangerous thing about the old gods is their patience. We had to use time travel to defeat Nazoth during Cataclysm after all, because his plan was so thoroughly put together, and even then he had apparently accounted for that by aligning himself with Morazond, and even if that's not the case, we still had to at the very least cheat with time travel to win. And so with this in mind, I have to wonder if Yogg Saron was playing the long game. I mean, if Yogg is currently on the move with the Drust and we aren't actively hunting him like the Zoth in BFA, then we should be very, very worried. And yes, where I do think we technically defeated the old gods at the end of BFA and Azeroth is no longer dealing with a physical infection, we still don't know where Seathun and Yogg Saron went after we defeated them. It's reasonable to assume they went back to the Shadow, but if they still have a presence in locked off portions of the Emerald Dream, my bets are they didn't give up on corrupting Azeroth that easily, and just waiting for the opportune moment to strike. Now there is a third possibility to all this, as in who is behind the power of the Drust, that doesn't involve an old god. However, you know how 2 plus 2 equals 4 minus 1 equals 3, so Illuminati? This third option is kind of like that. There's some very interesting research, the Anath in Gold Nath can be turned into Anath, however the proper pronunciation of that word is actually Anath, the H is silent. From there if you look up Anath without the H, you run into a very interesting goddess. And what shocked me about her was how deeply her stories were related to another IRL god I keep accidentally running into in my research. This quack line of research coupled with the cycle steely and its last vestige having the oddest description and coloration basically create a very unlikely theory the Drust are quite possibly servants of something very, very old and powerful that was corrupted a long time ago and at the very least has the ability to access the Emerald Dream, the Shadowlands, the physical universe 
and for a time, alternate Draenor. And on that, I do think the Silent Skull Curse has something to do with what's going on in Nardwild with the Drust, but honestly, other than the masks directly mimicking each other in their effects, I can't find a connection. Outside of an even more cracked theory that builds off the third option and or diving into an attempted explanation of how time travel works in World of Warcraft. So overall, the Winter Scorn got cursed to exist within a dream prison designed by Ysera and his dormant. The Drust came along and destroyed the Winter Scorn's bodies which likely trapped their spirits in a secluded part of the dream of forever. Then, most likely, Yogg-Saron who had access to the dream offered his power to the spirits of the Winter Scorn in the form of these corrupted masks. They likely took up the offer and became the first corrupted Drust. While this was going on, Yogg likely using the Drust's innate connection to druidism and savage nature influenced the Drust's culture to the point at which they were basically reliant on his form of nightmare for power. He then possibly allowed the Drust to lose to the Gaultirans in turn allowing him to gain full control over their culture, and from there I think he patiently waited for the time his special brand of Faceless and Nightmare would become truly useful. That time seems to be now as the Drust have made significant moves in BFA and are making more in Shadowlands. The scary thing is, what we've currently seen of the Drust in BFA and what's coming in Shadowlands appears to be a fraction of the army of Drust yogg actually controls. Now how is all this going to affect the future of the story? Well, it seems like we're definitely going to go back to the Emerald Dream to deal with another form of the Nightmare. And we may also have to deal with Yogg-Saron figuring out a way to revive himself and or bring his form of the Nightmare into the physical universe. If the Winter Scorn's souls were trapped within a Dream Prison, Ysera and Nosdormu are going to need to answer a few questions, because they are a big reason why the Drust as we currently know them exist. The possible revelation that Ysera and Nosdormu helped create the Drust could also be an interesting event to look forward to. Further in the future, this may set up connection between Yogg-Saron and the Jailer depending on whether the Drust are attacking Ardenweald at the Jailer's behest, or whether they are just being opportunistic. I am also curious as to whether the Drust are going to become the new trolls of World of Warcraft, which I honestly think could create some very promising stories in the future. Just to clarify that statement, from vanilla through mists, without fail, there was always, at the very least, one zone or patch dedicated to the trolls, which over the years episodically built upon their lore. In Ward and Legion this trend stopped, but then in BFA all those years of world building came to roost in the reveal of Xandalar and basically half an expansion release dedicated to the trolls. It will be interesting to see if the Drust get the same treatment. Also, if the Drust are related to Yogg-Saron, and Thros is Yogg-Saron's own version of the Dream, possibly the Lucid Dream or something along those lines, I am personally now ultra curious about what Sithun's chaotic dream would look like, and whether there are still parts of Yasharaj's dream still out there. I mean, this could be a very, very early setup for a proper Emerald Dream expansion on the far horizon. Lastly, because I forgot to mention it earlier, if Nazoth's alternate drain equivalent is the Amorphic Cognitors, then I'm willing to say yogg Saron's word equivalent are the Podlings, which may sound like an insult, but let's be clear, there is a reason why the Batani, the literal plant people of Draenor, do not keep those psychotic, ravenous little shits around. For those who haven't done the quests in the Gloomshade Grove or don't remember them, this is the type of shit those crazy little things are into. And I know this is kind of off topic, but you know how the enemy infiltration preface mentioned creatures of life are insidious? Which is saying something because it was likely written by a Nathrazim? Yeah. Fly around what? You'll eventually find the disturbing stuff, and know precisely why he said that. Creatures of unordered nature, or just straight nature, are incredibly nasty. Thank you for watching.